never act in fear, always act in love. Uh, the importance of this theme can't be underestimated because it's one of the 12 laws of healing and inner peace. Never act in fear, always act in love. So if you're watching this right now, you might notice that my background is a little bit different. Uh, that's because I'm not at home. In fact, I'm not even in my home country. Right now, I am in the Philippines. Why I'm in the Philippines is a whole story in itself. I suppose I'm on a manhunt of sorts. Over the past year, I have spent some time vetting uh, potential candidates in my personal life uh, for marriage. Um, there was one particular woman who uh, direct messaged me. She found me on TikTok. And we struck up a conversation and we started to hit it off well. And so we spent several months getting to know each other. And um, it became clear to me at a certain point that I had a real candidate for marriage. And I uh, openly discussed my plans and intentions with her. And she happened to be Filipino. And to live here in the Philippines, she has never left the country before. About a month and a half ago, she was diagnosed with a terminal illness. At which point, we had already decided that we were going to get married. And we had decided on the date. Uh, that we would be looking towards uh, once we got a chance to meet each other in person. So we were setting up plans for me to come down here and to meet her in person and, and to proceed. Uh, but it was sudden and shocking when she got the news uh, or the symptoms rather that um, she had a terminal illness. She was rushed to the emergency room. She went to the hospital. She was at the hospital for a few days, uh, maybe around a week or so um, while they were doing tests. And she let me know of the serious diagnosis uh, that she was experiencing. Um, so um, They were going to, they decided to discharge her from the hospital so that she could uh, convalesce, uh, but she would have to leave uh, the city where she was working on her um, career and she would have to leave her career behind and go to the country where her parents live. Because of this terminal illness, it's highly contagious. So if she were to stay here, um, she could face eviction from her house. Um, so she had to go into the country. Um, the problem of this country place where her parents live, it's out in the mountains. So when she goes to visit her parents here in the mountains, um, she has no electricity, uh, no internet, uh, no uh, cell phone coverage reaches the mountains. Um, and um, that would mean that we would lose communication until she either uh, heals and comes out of the mountains or until... I come down and in order to come down, it's a lot easier said than done because the level of ruralness in this mountain camp where uh, she lives is such that there are no house numbers on the house. There is no address on the house. 
Um, it's just, uh, you have to like know like family nicknames. That's how you would find, um, where the person actually lives. And so once you uh, got the diagnosis, and by the way, for those who are listening and wondering if this is just an illustration or if I'm being serious, I'm being dead serious. I'm, I'm not, I'm not telling you any stories right now. This is real. And yes, this person is real. And we spoke over video several times. Um, Once she got the diagnosis, we were able to have limited communication. Um, the signal at the hospital where she's staying, and you have to remember the Philippines is a developing country. Uh, so it's uh, the infrastructure is non-existent in, in much of the country. So with our final messages, I try to give some reassurance because when she got the news, it took a toll on her emotional well-being. She said that she felt like her life was over because going there into the mountains means she loses communication with me 100%. And we have been talking every day. Uh, we would even study the Bible together. And... Um, it means that she loses her career that she's been building for four years <laughs> solidly. Um, so um, her parents finally reached the hospital and um, they took her home to her parents' home, which is again in the mountains where there is no internet, no telephone, no electricity, um, no address to write a letter, and uh, no cell phone coverage. So in the questions I was able to ask, I was able to get some of them answered, but she was kind of a little bit out of it because, again, her health is depleting at this point. Um, the treatment takes six to nine months and I couldn't believe it, uh, but I looked up the treatment uh, online for this illness. And although it's not as common in the United States anymore, it's very common here in the Philippines. And it is true. Even in the United States, it takes six to nine months to recover fully from, from the illness. After four weeks, it's no longer contagious. Um. So I uh, I was able to get some small pieces of information uh, as to the general area where she lives, which is that's considered the address, which is just a camp. Um, and camp is like next down from a village, right? So you got city town village and then you got a camp it was just small um and uh that was it she was gone now i'm left with a choice i can wait in the comfort of my home in the united states for six to nine months and maybe she survives gets better maybe she finds her way out of the mountains and gets uh in contact again and maybe we pick up from there and that's uh it's a reasonable option uh however um that would mean a possible compromise on her mental health in the meantime so she might not be able to uh, cope well or survive if her mental health depletes because she feels like her life is over and there's no options and she has no contact uh, with the outside world. Um, so it's possible that I could sit home and wait and never hear from her again and never really know what happened to her. Um, or 
I could buy a ticket to the Philippines, come down, and although it would be nearly impossible to find a Filipina in the Philippines, <laughs> in the mountains, with no proper address, and by the way, I never got the proper family nickname, so I have her real name, but I don't have her nickname. Um, it's a near impossibility, but if I were to come, then I don't have to live just wondering what happened. Is, is she okay? Um, of course, if I were to come down, there's enormous risk. The area that she lives in is very rural. Um, tourists can get kidnapped, held for ransom. They can get killed. I could contract an illness. Uh, it's just dangerous in general. If you've ever seen the way people drive <laughs> in developing countries, no offense, because I know this is a worldwide broadcast, but if you know, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, just dangerous in general. So there's all types of dangers associated with leaving the comfort, the safety and the familiarity of my home and then coming and going on a manhunt in order to hopefully find the person. But if I were to find the person, I could provide support, not just financial but emotional support, mental health support, and um, uh, oops, uh, mental health support, and I can potentially um, move her here into the city that's nearby the mountains where she'll be able to have access to internet and watch Netflix like a normal person and while she's getting better. And she could have nursing care here, and all that could be provided. So there's a there's a chance that I could support her. Her parents are elderly, by the way. Um, so no doubt this is having to care for her is taking a toll on them as well. Not to mention uh, they're it's a poor family as well, financially. So I decided to get on my horse and come down just for the chance just for the opportunity to potentially be able to provide that support to be able to help her so i got my tickets and i decided to come down now this ties in very nicely with our theme which is never act in fear always act in love what motivates me to come and try to find her is love. It's the fact that I can provide some support, some help, some encouragement to help her get through this most difficult situation in her life that she's probably encountered thus far. If I stayed home, it would probably be because of fear. How do I know that I'm not going to get hurt? or that I have all the information, or that I would even find her, right? Because fear would stop me from doing something that could reap a very beautiful reward. Because what if I did uh, find success in my manhunt, which would be a very small percentage chance. At that point, it would be... Um, a very amazing surprise for her because there's no way she ever believed that I could or would be able to, to be able to find her in this case. So I've begun my hunt. I've been here for uh, one full day, a half day, and this is starting my third day. So basically I've been here about two days and today is the start of my third day. Day one, when I arrived, I immediately rented a vehicle and started driving the road, as Google Maps would say, to where it would get to her camp. But of course, as I expected, 
as you start to get to the mountain and climb the mountain, the road becomes just pure rocks, like about this big, and boulders, in order to be able to reach to the top of the road. Um, so the vehicle, uh, which was a basic car that I rented, is not going to cut it. In order to climb the mountain properly, I would need an SUV like Jeep type thing, like a truck, or I would need a dirt bike in order to be able to, to get up there. Um, so I, for day two or the, my first full day here, I was able to rent a truck. The people here in the city um, felt very afraid for me because I'm a tourist, as they say, or a foreigner, and I'm going off into the great beyond where they don't even go. <laughs> and and i'm gonna go searching for this person and so um they said that i should take someone with me so um yesterday i took two gentlemen with me from town here uh to go with me one kind of helping with translation the other one knew the area because he had been there before so he knew how to get there and so we went off and I can't go into detail on how difficult this is and how uh, shocked everyone is that I'm here doing what I'm doing. But um, we climbed a literal mountain. And yes, I, I get the cliche that I'm climbing a mountain for love. Um, and it was hard. It was difficult. Um, when we reach to a certain point, there's like a little village there. It's like a base camp. And there's like a kind of like a chief of the camp, like a village leader. And so I met with the village leader of this base camp and explained to them what we're doing. Of course, they were shocked, but they lent us some dirt bikes uh, so that we could start scaling to the top of the mountain. And so we're riding on these dirt bikes and we get to a point to where the path on the mountain becomes so narrow like this that you have to just walk it. And yeah, there's kind of like a cliffish type things here, right? Where you kind of fall to your doom. So we would walk the path and then it becomes very beautiful. And it's like, there's a river and there's stones where you're prancing from stone to stone through the river and it's mountains everywhere and it's gorgeous. And finally we reach uh, this camp. Uh, it's called Glab in the Philippines. It's barely findable on, on Google Maps. And uh, we, we get to the camp and the first place that you get is the, uh, the school that's there. Um, and then you can go and talk to the the chief who's up there, the village leader. And um, so I did both. I talked to people in the school and talked to the, the village leader. They don't know the last name because all I have is the last name. She did confirm to me when I asked her, you know, is this, do your parents have the same name? He said, yes, but when you come here, no one will know that because everyone knows each other by nicknames. And so without the nickname of her parents, which I never got, no one knows her by a picture. And I don't have pictures of her parents. Nobody knows the real last name. In fact, as many of you are doubting that she actually exists, the people on the top of the mountain also doubted that she actually exists. And the people on the bottom of the mountain doubted that she actually exists. And so the people on the top of the mountain said, aren't you afraid to be here being a foreigner? And that's the same thing the people on the bottom of the mountain said. When I went back down after my search for the day, the people on the bottom of the mountain said, you need to be careful. This is crazy for you to be out here like so I got a lot of that, the fear mongering, right? The, hey, are you doing too much? Which we already have our own voice in our head, right? 
Have you ever tried to do something difficult? And then as you get there, the people who are there say, hey, what are you doing? Why are you trying to do something difficult? Don't do that. You get hurt. If you have, then you could relate to how I felt at the top of the mountain and at the bottom of the mountain. Everyone had something negative to say because they didn't recognize her and they didn't know the last name. Now, again, I wasn't surprised because I know her personality and the way she described it. She never made me think she lived amongst the camp with the most of the people. And she said that they wouldn't know by the last name. They have to have the family nickname. When I was done asking around at the top of the mountain, I came back down and, and started talking to the people at the base camp again. And there was a girl at the base camp who said she recognized uh, my girlfriend. And then everyone who was saying that she wasn't real shut up. And uh, the problem was she didn't know the name or she didn't know the parents, but she was about the same age as my girlfriend. So she recognized her. So she confirmed that you know, this is indeed a real person. We just don't know how to how to find her or which house she lives in. Uh, and yeah, technically it would be a fiance, but I haven't gotten to give the proper ring yet. Um, so I came home last night traumatized. One, because I had to drive over rocks that were this big and it's just rocks for like miles and you're just in the truck like this. And then when you get to the end, you got to ride a dirt bike, which is scary in itself going up a mountain and then when you get to the end of that you have to walk and that's the only way to get into this this village where she lives um on top of that i've got everyone like we're scared for you why are you not more scared so i'm getting the message very clear and i understand that all of you who are in your various countries in the united states and, and uk and canada are scared for me as well. So don't worry. You don't need to give me more of that. I got the message. I know everyone is afraid. Um, but should we live our life according to fear? Should we live our life according to fear? Fear is an emotion. And it's a helpful one. Fear is... Uh, physiological stress that you feel when you get hormones poured into the system. And I definitely have felt that even on this trip, even telling you this story, I feel the fear. But should I allow fear to stop me from telling you my story? What do you think? Would you have preferred? I said, no, I'm afraid to tell them about this. Should I allow fear to stop me from making the trip it's not an easy question right many people feel that we should be cautious and so they're saying well roman we don't want you to be fearful but hey you got to be cautious you got to make sure you 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 know what you're doing before you do it and to that i say absolutely Caution is essential. Fear is not to be the leader of our life. You can feel the fear, but fear is not to be your main motivation in life. You must be mainly motivated by love. If you allow fear to be your motivator in life, then it will imprison you. And it surprises me how many people choose the prison of fear instead of the freedom of risk and safety. Or said, I'm sorry, instead of the freedom of risk and reward. There are real risks in your life that you are afraid to take. And I need you to analyze for yourself what are those risks that you are afraid to take. Analyzing is key for deciding whether to move forward despite the fear that you feel. The fear is not an indication that the move is the wrong move to make. 
In fact, the moves in life that have the most risk also sometimes have the most reward. I don't advocate uh, jumping out of an airplane or uh, off of a building in the name of conquering your fear. Conquering the fear means to subdue it, to lead it as your slave, instead of allowing yourself to be a slave to it. In order to do that, we need to stop, pause, meditate, and analyze each situation. In my case, when I analyze the life of never knowing versus taking the risk to possibly be able to provide support and to demonstrate love, I chose to take the risk. And I know it works because persistence pays because I've lived a life where I didn't live according to fear. And as a result, I reaped rich rewards. The time that I needed to start my business and the time that I needed to close the business and move to South America and the time that I needed to do my own movie, create my own album, or the time that I started this foundation that I'm doing now. Times that I've had to sell my business. Sometimes I sold my house and sold my car. We have to make moves in life in order for us to be alive instead of just trying to stay alive. It's not living if you're just merely staying alive. Let me illustrate that for you. Would you rather live 80 years in a jail cell or 40 years with total freedom and all of the resources that you need to enjoy that freedom? Think about that for a moment. 40 years with total freedom or 80 years in a jail cell and then you die. Think about it. In reality, if you had to choose, <laughs> many people would say, "Ah, just give me the 40 years of a good life. I can actually enjoy it. Yeah. So let me ask you, why have you been choosing the jail cell? the jail cell of safety. You've been afraid to take the risk to join the social groups, to start the business. You've been afraid to take the risks to enroll in the school or to quit the school that you don't want to be a part of. You've been afraid to take the risk to quit the job and you've created for yourself a prison and you're living in jail, hoping to get 80 years out of that sucker. I could die on this mountain. But if I die, I will have died in love and in freedom. That is a life that I choose to live. Caution is not the same as fear. Fear is an emotion. Caution is a strategy. Caution is a strategy. It's intellectual strategization. <laughs> strategizing <laughs> i can't say strategy yeah whatever Strategi strategizing caution is intellectual strategy so it's looking at a situation analyzing it and taking necessary precaution in order to do what you're going, going to do so an example of this is uh, let's say you need to uh, drive 30 miles from your house if you live by fear alone the fear can stop you from getting behind the wheel of a car at all because it's very risky, isn't it? Cars are dangerous. But if you decide to live according to your dream, according to purpose, according to love, you may say, I'm going to go ahead and go to the store, but I'm going to wear my seatbelt. The seatbelt represents caution. The reason why you should wear your seatbelt, and you certainly should, is not because of fear. I'm afraid. No, no, no. You're wearing it out of intellectual strategy. Because you know that if certain circumstances were to line up on a certain percentage basis, that seatbelt could save your life. So we use strategy along the way in order to get to where we want to go. That's caution.
So for instance, when the village, when the people locally told me, you should not go alone, I heeded the the, the uh, warning and took caution and brought people with me to go up onto the mountain. Does that make sense? That's using caution. It's not because I was afraid. It's because I was taking the necessary cautions. I was listening to the warnings. But I won't allow the warnings and the fear-mongering to stop me from being able to live my life altogether. And so I will continue to live according to love and according to dreams. And I'm telling my story so that you can have a clear example of what bravery looks like so that you can actually apply it in your life in order to get the things out of life that you truly want, that you truly desire, and frankly, that you deserve, you will need to take some risks. So instead of contemplating my situation in my life and how you don't agree with my decision or you don't believe or you're worried about me, don't allow my sacrifice to be in vain. Learn right now to stop living your life according to fear. Fear is not to be your guide. It's an alarm system. It's a bodyguard. It's a protector. But it has to work for you. So you pay attention to it because you stop and you meditate, you deliberate, and then you decide how you will live your life. Because if I don't get anything out of this, if I never find her, I'm going to have a good story to tell. I'm going to have a life that I felt was worth living. And I'll take my 40 of love, happiness, dream, and purpose over my 80 in jail. So please take this information and take a very hard look at your life. And start thinking about your situation. As for today, it is literally 90 degrees. <laughs> it is so hot here. I am going to scale the mountain again. I'm going to go up to the villages, the base camp, and then the one at the top of the mountain. I'm going to talk to the village leader. And I'm going to ask if I can teach the people in their camp how to resolve anxiety and depression. Because we're going to make the best of the situation. I am going to continue to search. I am going to use precaution. But um, this is a story that is at this point to be continued. Uh, I ask that you respect the privacy of all the persons involved and be patient. I'll provide updates in due time, but this is a deeply personal situation and it is all very real. So thank you so much for all of your support. And I hope that you can learn from this example. We'll talk to you soon.